All right. So, chapter 24, the Boulder Canyon Project Act. Okay? So, Boulder Canyon Project Act. What do we normally term, what, what's the normal term that we use for this area? Okay, for the era, yes, the Great Depression, but what, where is the Boulder Canyon Project? And what is it? Ding, 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 it's in Boulder Canyon, which is where? Close. Nope. Colorado. Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> Nevada and Arizona, yes. It forms the border of Nevada and Arizona, okay? It's uh, the Hoover Dam. And how important is the Hoover Dam? Very, very important. Very, very, very important. Very, very important. To Nevada and um, California, California and Arizona. Yes, especially L.A. So, um, we didn't get to go to the... <clears throat> We had some problems on our vacation, like breaking down and <laughs> losing some time there. But so we lost the time that we were going to take to go to the cross over the new bridge. And it's not all that new, but I haven't been across it yet. But you can go to the uh, Hoover Dam and you can actually tour the Hoover Dam and go down in the turbines down there. But as you're driving across the desert, um, we were south and west of the Hoover Dam. As you're driving across the desert, anywhere in, in uh, the west, you'll see power lines, okay, the power grid, all right? And as we were looking at it, there were four of the huge, and they're different sizes, but the enormous ones that have what, like six lines on them each. There were four rows of them coming out of the, out of the, the, the dam. Okay, so you had different ones. Um, you had uh, like on Highway 95, to the west of Highway 95, you had the solar panels, the like enormous acres and acres of solar panels. Right, and there were actually two. They increased it since in the last two years from one set to two. It looks like they're building a third one now. Um, but you saw the power lines coming out of those and headed into Vegas. You saw the power lines coming out of the Boulder, um, out of out of the Hoover Dam, going toward L.A. It's it's amazing as you drive through the desert to see. Just the the uh, expanse and the the need for such great power uh, generation coming out of uh, out of these natural areas and and uh, the natural areas that they you know have dammed up like Lake Mead. Has anyone been I to the? I used to live right. I used to live right in. Um... Kingman, Arizona, which is right on the, it's right on the border of, uh, Marblehead City, um, Arizona is, and then Laughlin, Nevada. Mm -hmm. It's about two hours, an hour and a half, two hours from the Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And like, as you said, it, it, the Hoover Dam blocks up Lake Mead, but that's also the, Col the Colorado River runs right through there, right between so it was the three states, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And actually those big, those big transmitters that you're talking about, they actually, they run from the Hoover Dam um, along 95 and then they cut off and then they start to go through, they, they run right next to you from on Route 66 all the way into LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Route 66. So it's, it's pretty amazing. We were in Bull, uh, Bullhead City. That's where we were for spring break. And it's, it's phenomenal to, just to see the um, the four, you know, because you're used to one, you're used to two, but then you've got the four. <laughs> it was pretty impressive. And here is what the Boulder Dam looked like 
1941, which was renamed the Hoover Dam. And then here's a current photo. They built the bridge because they were worried that uh, terrorists might blow it, uh, which would wreak havoc, of course, on L.A., which is one of the largest cities in the United States. You can't, some vehicles are allowed to go across the dam still. Uh, trucks, no truck is, is allowed to go across the dam. But you are allowed to go, um, and you can see there was parking there on the edges, and you can walk across the dam, and you can also go down in for a, for a tour. But you can also. Since, uh, I, since 2008, I was down, like I was down there. We always drove over the dam at the time. I don't know when they changed it, but we always drove right over the dam. But like you can go down on that. They take you down an elevator, mm -hmm. way, way down. It's really, it's really far. And then they have all the. You can't hear anything. The turbines are huge. Yeah. Way underneath in the ground there. Yeah, they're the size of homes. The the turbines. It's amazing. It is a lot of water. And it's, I don't know, it, it, it's kind of disconcerting as you're standing there realizing how much water is behind that dam. <laughs> okay, so the crash and the depression. You have Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929. What happened? Nicholas, do you know? Stop on the crash? Yes, it was. It was the big crash um, that most people refer to, and it really started the Great Depression, which lasted how long? Ten years? Ten years? Or no, ten years. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> All right, y'all are going to have to look that up, okay? Uh, <clears throat> not, not quite. It says on PowerPoint, 1929 to 1932, so that's a 13 years? 14 years? Uh, no. Oh, that's uh... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> In a four years. Yeah, basically four years. Less than basically four years. <laughs> okay. You guys. Don't mind me. Just party. My mouth is off. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so you have President Roosevelt coming in. All right. But you have uh, President Hoover who's having to deal with certain things. You've got... Um, <clears throat> this frenzied upsurge in stocks and one of the reason for that one of the reasons was that you could buy on margin so you could give a certain amount of money but you'd have to pay interest like a margin interest on that in order to gain the full amount of money okay does that make sense so you're buying on margin so you're buying on credit really Okay, but um, so if you have ten thousand dollars and the maintenance margin is fifty percent, okay, five thousand dollars, right? So if your equity drops below that five thousand dollar mark, the broker can call it, meaning you have to come up with all five thousand dollars immediately, right? Your stock may no longer be worth five thousand dollars. This is what happened uh, during the, the crash, is that the stocks that were worth dollars became penny stocks. All right, so <clears throat> you weren't able to repay that. You were, you were called out. So all cash that you, all, all liquidity that you had, all right, everybody understand the term liquidity? Like cash, okay, you have, it, it's called liquidity because you have it available, and it's um, available immediately. If you have land, you can't always 
um, turn that land over immediately. Okay, that's not liquid. That's not a liquid asset. All right, you may have to wait for years to sell your land. All right, but cash is liquid. It's immediately available, except when you don't have it. <laughs> and this is what happened during the Depression. <clears throat> is they had this um, this upsurge, but 1928, even in 1925 they were starting okay in 1925 the stock market was worth 27 billion in October of 1929 it was worth 87 billion all right so people who weren't normally involved in the stock market were becoming involved in the stock market because they saw the opportunity to make a lot of money all right this also happened recently okay prior to 2000 and prior to 2008 okay stock market market crashed again in 08 that was the most recent uh, fiscal crisis is what they called it all right and so as you're buying a margin margin your stock moker stock brokers were lending up to 75 percent of the stock's cost but those stocks go down, you can no longer pay for it. All right? Also, one reason for that is that income tax cuts increase the flow of money into the market. All right? So you had disposable income. Does everybody understand disposable income? You remember disposable income? Extra money, right? Okay. So <coughs> you have even Calvin Coolidge saying, hey, stock market is good. You know, it's a great opportunity. Stock, stocks are a great place to put your cash. All right. They're cheap at the current prices. Didn't work out so well. And you also have investment trusts, which are luring novices in. Now, investment trusts are like mutual funds. Do you know what mutual funds are? Kind of? Mutual fund is uh, a fund that a person can buy into. And one of the keys to investments is diversification. Okay? Go back to the old adage, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Okay? If you buy a stock in, say, BP, okay, your stock, if you bought it 10 years ago, was worth quite a bit of money. If you buy it today, it's not, okay? The stock has decreased tremendously because of the latest oil spill um, in the Gulf of Mexico, all right? Now, that is buying a stock. If you buy a mutual fund, that mutual fund, everyone has a different focus, okay? But say you buy uh, a Vanguard the Vanguard Fund, okay? The Vanguard Fund is run by Vanguard, which is a stock company, mutual fund company, excuse me. What they do is they go through and buy a hundred different stocks. And they continually change those stocks and the amounts of those stocks, the number of shares in those stocks to keep their prices high, okay? To make the most on that investment. So they are diversifying for you, okay? It's an easy way to diversify your funds without most, without uh, placing, you know, a hundred different stock uh, requests in with your broker, okay? Which all require an additional fee. Every time you buy a stock, they're going to charge you a fee unless you have a certain amount of money. Okay, does that make sense? So it's a great way for for people who are starting out uh, to to diversify. And you can pick risky stocks and you can pick conservative stocks or funds, excuse me. Just like you can pick conservative and risky stocks, but they've done the picking for you and they are experts in the field and in theory you should be able to make money on it. Right? So these... Um, 
these investment trusts, which are similar to mutual funds, were luring people in because you could make some money, right? Another interesting factor here in this crash in 1929 is what industry faltered between 28 and 29? Does anybody know? No. What crashed in 2007? Which industry? I'll give you a hand. It's the same. It's the same. The bank. The bank. Banks were crashing, but the construction industry. Okay. Construction industry, mortgages. What was happening is the mortgage... Uh, <laughs> Them. They were the mortgage issues, and the mortgages, uh, they were issuing subprime loans for mortgages. So people who were getting mortgages in 2007 that really couldn't afford the mortgages. All right? And that's one reason that that happened. So you have a housing crash, you have a construction industry crash, your mortgages have a problem, your banks have a problem, and everything goes, right? Okay, construction industry was faltering 1928, 1929. So many similarities between this crash and the most recent one. Okay. Um, in 1928, the Federal Reserve Board raised the interest rates on the Federal Reserve banknotes to dampen speculation, to try to keep people from throwing all their money into it. All right didn't work. Um, in 1929, the Fed asked the banks to stop lending, making these really risky loans. Banks were making money. They said, yes or no? Nope, they didn't stop. And so, <clears throat> um, Black Thursday is the collapse. Uh, so you have these worthless stocks, you have swings, you have plunges. Um, it starts coming back and then drops again. Uh, but you have a president. Which president was um, was in the White House during the during Black Thursday? Hoover. Okay. And Hoover believed in what? Hands off. <clears throat> yes, but he also attacked it. Okay, he also attacked it, but what he really wanted uh, was it was hands off government. He wanted the individual businesses and city and state governments to deal with it. He didn't think the federal government should be um, a welfare state. He didn't think that it should take over um, a lot of the problems. Okay, so. <clears throat> He also does what many presidents do, and you'll hear this in your lifetime, that the economy is sound and prosperous. Regardless of what's happening in the stock market, <laughs> many presidents will say the U.S. economy is good, it is strong, this is just a small downturn, and we are good. Okay? Why do presidents do that? Okay. Makes them sound like they have a plan to fix it. Makes people like them more. Why else? To get votes. To get votes because they like them more. Why else? Helps boost the American morale. American morale, yes. Very good. Thank you. It creates confidence in the economy. If you go out and say our economy has taken, uh, has, has tanked and we are heading into a huge recession, what happens? Panic. Okay? Panic. Your economy, no matter what country you live in, if your, if your people are panicking, um, and anybody who's invested in your country, 
are panicking, you're tanked. I mean, it's, it's a guarantee, right? Because they're no longer investing in your economy. They're no longer giving you that boost. You have to have that boost in order to keep the economy up. So you'll see presidents do this multiple times. All right. Um, very, and it's frustrating to many people because they're like, well, why can't you just be honest? Well, um, honesty will definitely tank the economy. If the, if the economy isn't already tanked, it's going to. If the president comes out and says, we're done for. Right? Does that make sense? All right, so here's, a, here's Hoover saying we're sound and prosperous. But <clears throat> as we head uh, after that uh, upswing in 1930, you know, we head into this depression that lasts like four years. And, it, and when I say depression, this isn't just uh, people are out of work kind of thing. People were actually starving. Like they had no food and they died because they had no food. All right. Um, it is a tremendous burden on the government. It's on the people. It's on, it's a, it's a global problem. Okay. The depression of that followed the Black Thursday crash. All right. <clears throat> so other causes of the depression was agriculture was depressed throughout the decade. Uh, there were wage increases that were lagging behind factory output. So you had an excess. Okay. Overproduction by the assembly line. Excess. You have industries who were seriously overtaxed or overextended. So they borrowed a lot of money to build these big factories and then they don't have anybody to sell anything to. All right. Because they have too much of an excess. And your industry couldn't attract investment because technology was lagging. Um, and then some blame the, blame the federal, uh, the Fed's tight money policies in the early 1930s because there was reduced capital for businesses to, uh, to grow or to use for investment. So was this the, were these the only reasons? No, this is global. This is global. Look at Europe, where you have these war debt payments that are not coming in, right? That are huge, that are creating problems in these other countries, right? And there was a severe trade imbalance, okay? Which means we had a trade deficit where we had more imports than exports because nobody else could buy, all right? The European nations couldn't buy. They were our biggest buyers, right? And so um, it was crippling the U.S. export, which led to excess, right? So you see how they're all tied together? Does that make sense? Well, uh, some of it just sat there. And some of it sat there until they were able to uh, reuse it in, say, World War II, or they were able to sell it later when the economy rebounded. Because it did eventually rebound. And that's one of the things, is that generally your economy will rebound. Um, <clears throat> Sell by, are you, so you're talking food? The food w would all go bad when there were excesses of food. Um, people were starving and, and farmers were told to slaughter the, the pigs and to burn their corn because it was, there was too much of a glut on the market. All right. Which, of course, created more problems because Honestly, people are starving and you're getting rid of the food because it's hurting the economy to have it on the market. Right? Not the best choice, perhaps, in the middle of the Depression to do that. But that's, that's what they did because economically, that's what you do. 
You don't want too much of an excess on the market. Does that make sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> historically, these depressions that America has faced, and, and uh, remember we've faced multiple depressions to this point, were were seen as like natural disasters, okay? Little could be done about them, all right? But he did respond. Hoover did respond. Um, but because he didn't think that the federal government should be totally involved, it limited some of his options. So he was urging businesses to keep the wages high and keep people employed. Did it work? Uh, yes, it would it would come, <laughs> uh, but the businesses eventually did lay these people off. So <clears throat> the Emergency Committee for Employment would coordinate these voluntary relief efforts, right? They were all voluntary. Did the voluntary efforts work? To a degree, right. Really, they didn't because the the businesses finally said, no, we're not going to keep doing this. We're going to, they, and they did, they laid people off, which didn't help, didn't help the issue, right? Right. But in the meantime, the public opinion turned against Hoover, even though he was trying to do something, it wasn't enough because it was a serious problem all over the country. So in 31, you've got this budget deficit that's looming, and Hoover increases tax. So he increases the tax, which, which uh, takes money out of the economy, right? So that hurts the economy as well. So as you raise taxes, anytime you raise taxes, is it popular or unpopular? <laughs> right. <laughs> unpopular. Mo most people don't want to willingly raise taxes. Although this morning, 300 millionaires have asked the state of New York or the city of New York to raise taxes. Um, and that's just one byline that I heard this morning. Not the rest of the story, right? But very rarely do you hear people asking to, um, hey, let me pay more taxes, okay? Very rarely. So as uh, as things are changing, as, as Hoover's popularity is decreasing because we're in the middle of, we're in this depression, uh, they're losing, uh, they're losing House and Senate votes in the midterms, right? And <clears throat> what he did also is he set up the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to make loans to banks and other lenders, all right? And this would create local jobs and state jobs and pump 1.2 billion into the economy, okay? But Hoover was warning that this could lead to socialism and collectivism, okay? So we've got, we have these two vying thoughts here. You know, we want to help, but we don't want to go too far. We don't want to be a socialistic um economy we don't be, want to be a socialistic government okay so you have these these two issues that are vying with one another so <clears throat> this chronic unemployment was really demoralizing all right so there's more and more discontent there's more and more protest suicide rate is is climbing farmers are losing their their lands because they can't pay their taxes um, they can't pay their mortgages, right? You have um, World War I bonus veterans, okay? They were guaranteed by Congress to, um, to receive a bonus within 20 years of their service, all right? So they marched on Washington and asked Hoover and Congress to grant them their bonuses okay they needed them then they said please grant us our bonuses now we're entitled to them right that you've told us that we can have them 
Hoover said, no, we're not going to do that. And he sent the army in and he burned all the shanties that they had built. So many people of these bonus marchers who had fought in World War I um, had just lost all of their possessions because they had, that they had brought with them, right? Many of them had no home to go to, no home left to go to because they had already lost their homes. And this was one of their last, <laughs> one of their last resorts and they lost everything then, all right? Your book, uh, do you have the picture in the book? My version is a little bit different. Do you have the picture in the book of them burning the bonus bets? Yeah. Okay. So the bonus bets, uh, this also was a indicator to the public that Hoover was heartless. Okay. Could he have dealt with this differently? Probably in hindsight, he might have chosen to. Um, but this is this is what happened. So the bonus bets uh, were out, both their bonus and and uh, all of their worldly possessions for some of them. So by June of 1932, there were 10,000 bets who were jobless, um, who were in D.C. for that. So they had also brought their families, and they went in with tear gas. That's one of the. Uh, one of the more famous situations that happened during the Depression, in that, especially with Hoover. Okay? So, <clears throat> the election of 1932, Hoover's running again. He's not very popular, you can see. And, you know, they're blaming the, the Depression on Hoover. Was it all Hoover's fault? No. Is it always the president, the sitting president's fault? No, not everything. <laughs> but but they are, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how things work. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm glad that you all have realized that you can't just automatically blame the sitting president. So <clears throat> as Hoover is losing to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <clears throat> Roosevelt is saying, I pledge a new deal to the American people. He had very few concrete plans. All right. Some presidents run on platforms of non-concrete plans. Um, you know, in some elections, you can get away with that. In many elections, you can't. Right. But at this point, people were desperate. I mean, People are starving, desperate, right? <clears throat> so the Democrats took Congress and the Democrats took the presidency, right? So you've got Roosevelt and his circle. So he brings in, does anybody have any questions? So I have a question. I'm a Hoover fan. Yes. Was that, um, was that one of the projects that he tried to agitate to get people back working? Or that came about with Roosevelt. Oh. He had, uh, when was that signed? Um, in 1928. So <clears throat> it was started then, and it wasn't called the Hoover Dam then because people didn't really like him. Right? But it was one thing that uh, it wasn't directly in result of getting people to work. It was because that was a federal project and the federal government wasn't always about getting people to work at that time. Wait, it was a federal project? Yes. Federal, the Hoover Dam was a federal project. Mm -hmm. So they really built it like during Roosevelt's terms. Aiden. So, which of the two presidents officially brought us out of the Great Depression? Oh, that's a great, great question because what experts now say, what economists now say, is that had FDR not spent his 100 days and come up with all of these reforms, that the American economy would have come 
out of the depression earlier than it did. So the depression ended during Roosevelt's terms. It ended because we started, we, we became involved in the war. All right, the war is what pulled us out. Okay, but economists say had he left it alone, the market economy that we have would have overturned and compensated and come out of the depression soon. You know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, who knows if it truly would have, but that's what economists are saying today. Would it affect the economy? Go. He <clears throat> let's go over him. <laughs> he he has many that he implemented that affect us today, not just then. So, uh, where are we? Okay, so the hundred days, the first hundred days, he's bringing in all these um, all these people to f help him. And they're coming up with all of these new ideas, okay? Reform ideas. And not all of them are completely new. He's begging and borrowing and, and stealing using certain ideas from the progressive age. He's using certain ideas that people are bringing in from whole house and the settlement uh, houses, okay? So he's encompassing a lot. He's trying a lot of different things, all right? So... <clears throat> He exuded confidence and hope, which was something that he really needed to, all right? And the president at this time needed to exhibit those for the American people because people were, were losing hope, all right? So <clears throat> some of the things that he did that were uh, new and unusual is he appointed the first woman cabinet member, uh, Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, okay? Um, it was a group of progressives and lawyers and professors, many liberal professors in his circle, all right, that were coming up with this. So <clears throat> more than between March and June of 1933, more than a dozen key measures were implemented, all right? And <clears throat> he was, let's see, let's go to... I mean, he was dealing with banking, agriculture, uh, energy, the stock market, again, farms. Uh, he was trying to deal with pretty much everything that was, uh, everything within society, almost, okay? So the Emergency Banking Act took... Uh, came up with procedures for may, uh, for um, managing failed banks, okay? Tightening those regulations that Hoover had asked them to tighten, but they didn't, okay? Uh, so Roosevelt comes in and says, we're going to tighten them, all right? You're, you're not going to do this. And because so many banks were failing, because nobody could pay them back, right? Unemployment, unemployment relief created the Civilian Conservation Corps to provide jobs for young men. So $25 a month, these young men would work by building things and and going out to work and send it home, all right? So it was helping their families. Uh, Agriculture Adjustment, Federal Emergency Relief Act, right? $500 million in relief grants administered by the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Right, uh, you can see Harry Hopkins was in charge of that. It has ties to the Matanuska Valley, in the Alaska Far Away film that you watched. Okay, direct correlation. Tennessee Valley Authority. That dam is still producing energy for that area of the country. Okay, and far away as well. So building dams on the Tennessee River uh, for power, flood, and erosion control. Also used for recreation, okay? Um, so it was a definitely a poverty-stricken area. Um, they did, 
dam up and they did lose entire communities that were then flooded um, but overall they were working to address the power needs and the poverty needs of that region all right federal securities act all right um more information more work on wall street the banking act insuring all bank deposits fdic you go into any bank today it's fdic insured right you see that sign as you walk into the banks all right your savings if you belong to a, a credit union uh what is it it's not fdic it's it, uh, i can't think of the the acronym right now but they have one for the credit unions as well it's now worth 200 every you are insured by the federal government up to $250,000 so this put credit back into the banks saying that okay you're not going to lose all your money like people have when all these banks failed we will ensure that you won't lose all of your money we will give you at least $250,000 back today okay at this time it was five thousand all right this was huge it meant that people could again have confidence and put their monies in the banks which needed to make loans which put money into the economy right i mean the <clears throat> so they're they're working to to do that you've got the um national industrial recovery act you which created the national recovery administration the nra all right harold ix was running it and i might be pronouncing that wrong sorry but it was working on breaking the cycle of wage cuts and falling process uh falling prices and layoffs so you've got um, business leaders who are drafting codes of fair competition all right this was struck down by the Supreme Court later, but it was one more of those ideas that they had come up with to try to address the, the all-encompassing problems that the federal government and the people of the United States were facing. Right? You also have the Robert Wagner National Industrial Recovery Act, which affirmed the, wor the workers' right to unionize. All right. In the middle of the depression, you have the Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl was devastating. This is why you have so many farming acts. Because it was just devastating to this entire region of the country. All right. There was uh croplands that had been overplowed. It um they weren't using erosion control. They Every time they had any kind of start, uh, the locusts would come in, or the rabbits, because there was nothing growing. People would go to sleep at night, and you would lie down, and you would cover your head, because you would wake up, and the dust was so bad that you would have to shake it off. I mean, there was a layer of dust all over you every time you went to sleep. I mean, you couldn't see your barn on some days when the when the wind was blowing, and it went on for years. Okay, this is one of the reasons that you had such a um, exodus out of the Dust Bowl region, out to California, <coughs> and out to the West, because people couldn't make it. Right. All right. I'm guessing this dramatically changed back then. Mm -hmm. There were excesses in other regions, okay? Um, and when you have, like, if you, the way our market economy goes, if you have too much 
supply and not enough demand, your prices go down. And so they had been trying to compensate for it. Um, but you had people starving in the Dust Bowl and excesses in California. Right? Does that make sense? <laughs> Alaska is in a world all of its own. Yes, it is. But we were only a territory, too. We weren't a state. And we didn't have agriculture except when they started the Matanuska colony. Right? We didn't have, I should say, we didn't have... Um, a lot of agriculture. There was there was some. All right, so you're getting problems and controversies. Okay, the New Deal, starting all these new things, trying these new ideas. You're going to have feedback, and some of it's going to be positive, some of it's going to be negative, right? Um, you have, let's see, the American Liberty League. Charles Coughlin, Francis Townsend, and Huey Long. They were some of the, um, of the main critics of FDR and the New Deal, right? Huey Long could have possibly uh, had the best shot at upseating FDR, but he was assassinated. And um, in his organization really didn't go very far. They were, um, however, FDR did take some of his ideas and some of the ideas of his critics and incorporate them into his next presidential tenure. All right. Um, expanding the, the Federal Relief, the Works Progress Administration. So, You've got a landslide victory by FDR, and you have a theme here of him championing the poor and the working class in his in this um, 1930 in 1935, right? And so he's talking about the Second New Deal, where you're expanding the public works programs. You're going to give assistance to the rural poor, support organized labor. All right. Um, the other major project, benefits for retired workers and other at-risk groups. Okay, tougher business regulations for it. Heavier taxes on the well-to-do. All right, all things that are very popular with the people because they need as much help as they can get, right? Okay. Um, like in 1935, my grandparents moved up. They were part of the colonists in the Matanuska Valley. They came up in 34. And prior to coming up, he actually had a job, which was unheard of at this time. I mean, you, you saw the unemployment rates. He actually had a job prior to this. They decided, he decided, he came home and said, we're going to go to Alaska. <laughs> I don't think my grandmother was very happy. <laughs> and so he um, he came up and he got a job here during the Depression. So it's very unusual that, to have that happen. But on the, on the farm then, on the, on the colony farm, my grandmother and the kids did the farming. And he would come home after work and, and farm. But the kids, especially the, the boys, were responsible for doing, and my grandmother was responsible for doing most of the farming. So um, the Public Works Administration and, and that, who were working to help people, uh, you know, this was popular with many of the people because very few of the people were of the... Um, of the highest tax bracket, right? As with today, the 1%, talk about the 1%, right? 
same type of thing, 0.1%. Okay? So, with this, and talking about that, and talking about uh, retired workers, he's addressing what his critics were using to run against him, right? especially Huey Long. So, expanding the works progress, you've got... Um, You've got them trying to assist directly with the jobless, okay? We're not going to give you a hand up. We're going to put you to work, All right? So this was counterbalancing that socialistic, governmental, we're going to, um, we're going to fix the economy. We're going to do something for the economy, right? All right, so this was one way that they were, they were trying to accomplish that, um, and so it, this relief spending generated this large federal budget deficit, okay? $4.4 .4 billion in 1936. Spending during a deficit, is it a good idea, bad idea? What are we doing today? We are spending during a deficit, yes. We're taking out loans so that we can spend to keep our economy going, right? At this time, they were spending in a deficit, so they weren't making as much money as they were spending. Does everybody understand that concept? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the New Deal was not Keynesian. All right. Um, Keynesian was using deficit spending during the Depression to fund public works. Okay. They're going to come into that, and they're going to change. They're going to actually do the deficit spending. But FDR did not want to do that, right? He finally um, decided that he would. So the second New Deal was really this targeting the workers and the poor and the disadvantaged. All right, so major later New Deal legislation, civilian works, Civil Works Emergency Securities Exchange Act created the SEC, the Securities Exa uh, Exchange Commission. When you hear of fraudulent stock market issues or Wall Street issues, who, who's quoted in that? The SEC. Thank you. Yes, the SEC. Okay. It's still an organization that we we'll deal with. That we deal with. National Housing Administration, uh, the FHA. All right. If anybody here has a mortgage, usually there's FHA. FHA is involved today, as it was then. Okay. The Indian Reorganization Act halted the sale of tribal lands. Okay. Something that the it was. It was uh, reversing the Dawes Act. Okay, remember the Dawes Act? How that had changed um, the face of Indian lands throughout the U.S. Right? Okay, you've got the Indian Reorganization Act. So now those tribal lands are no longer for sale. Okay, so it enabled the tribes to actually um, regain their unallocated lands. Because they, the uh, amount of land that they had lost due to the Dawes Act was significant, all right? So this was um, one of the reform acts, really, of the New Deal. So Emergency Relief Appropriations National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, okay? Um, allowing collective bargaining rights, outlawing anti-union practices, all right, now collective bargaining, you might have heard in the last few years, has been um, reversed in Wisconsin. Okay, so it's uh, a controversial issue for unions in collective bargaining. Okay, but it also, this National Labor Relations Act also permitted a closed shop, which meant that all employees must join a union. Okay? In order to teach as an adjunct faculty at the University of Alaska, 
you do not have to join a union, but you have to pay union dues in order to teach. So it's one of those catch 22s, right? So if you're going to teach, you have to pay union dues, but you don't have to join. Technically. <laughs> so <clears throat> other issues. If I can get the pro. OK. National Youth Administration Revenue Act of 1935. Social Security Act, okay, another biggie, right? Do we deal with that today? Absolutely. Anybody who gets a paycheck has to pay Social Security, right? You have to put it in. Now, one of the things about Social Security is when they implemented it, they said, well, they're not going to be able to get rid of it easily because it's not all one-sided. The employee puts in and the employer puts in. So it's, it was harder to eliminate that act than others or those policies than others. All right? So it grants uh, workers' pensions, unemployment insurance, and other welfare benefits. Okay? If you are a minor and lose a parent, you receive Social Security. If you are disabled, you receive Social Security. Okay? Um, public Utilities Holding Company restricted gas and electric companies uh, to one geographic region. All right? The Rural Electrification Act. Okay? What came out of the Rural Electrification Act is what we hold here for our electric co-op. Okay? Which is an REA an REA, right? So uh, the Farm Tenancy Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, okay? Fair Labor Standards Act, what did it do? Child labor. Mm -hmm. It banned child labor and set a national minimum wage, okay? So remember, we had had a ban on it. It had been reversed. Now we're back. Right. So again, Social Security Act of 35, of course, long range significance. Um, and the New Deal really was ending when? It was. <clears throat> It's in this section, but uh, when did the uh, when did the Matanuska colony effectively end? Anybody remember? 1939. It's about the same time the New Deal ended, the Second New Deal. Okay. In row in the response to the New Deals. You have FDR who has now expanded the presidency and the social role of the state. Okay, The federal government has uh, changed dramatically in many ways. Okay, And um, he altered the balance of power between the White House and Congress in ways that many other presidents have not. All right? So in 36, you've got a landslide, again, with Roosevelt. And he had, uh, he had run against Alfred Lang Landon. Excuse me. All right. It was the greatest landslide since 1820. So you've got a new democratic coalition who now include urban immigrants, you include farmers, you include union workers, you include African Americans, you include women, because as Roosevelt has gone through the New Deal, the 
lives of all of those people have bettered, have become better, right? In many cases. Uh, under Hoover, they had declined. At the beginning of the Depression, they had declined dramatically, correct? He tried to deal directly with certain things that would improve certain aspects of every one of those people's lives, right? So he became very popular and it created more of a democratic coalition expanding the base of the Democratic Party. Does that make sense? Okay, so <clears throat> you've got the environment and the West and the Wilderness Society, the National Wildlife Federation. So, not surprisingly, soil conservation was a top priority of the environment and in the West, right? As you're looking at the Dust Bowl and you're looking at the impacts of all the people moving out West, you know, what's going on? And so Congress was setting aside wilderness areas. In 2008, there were 704 national wilderness areas, 107 million acres and 56 million of those in Alaska alone. All right? But what they were doing is they were setting aside tremendous amounts at this time. So also, Take this and think back, think back about what wilderness was doing between the conservationists and the preservationists, right? Think of John Muir, right? And think of how it was all about the clash between business and the environment, right? The conservationists said, uh, we want to include business with the public. Preservation says, preservationists said no commercial use. Right? So now you have wilderness areas set aside. And how does that tie in with business? Okay? So it's not necessarily anti business, but it is not as business friendly as some of the previous presidents. Correct? Okay, so <clears throat> soil conservation, the Taylor Grazing Act, the Farm Security Administration, all had tremendous impacts on the West. Um, you know, they were building Route 66 and expanding it. Um, if you ever get a chance to drive Route 66, it's a lot of fun. And it goes right through Kingman um, and right behind Bullhead City through Oatman in that beautiful area there. Okay, and these dams that they were putting in the West, like they had put in Hetch Hetchy, they had put in the Boulder Hoover Dam, right, uh, was creating electricity that was expanding and allowing more settlement out West. Okay, but they are also using irrigation, they were using soil conservation, flood control. Okay, so they're planning a lot of different things for the environment in the West. Questions? Okay. So FDR and the Supreme Court. This one's classic. Love this, right? So FDR sees the Supreme Court shooting down some of his things, okay? He didn't want any more of his acts struck down, okay? So uh, there were some conservatives sitting on the Supreme Court who really basically abhorred the New Deal. Didn't think that it was a good thing. All right? So FDR says, well, well, what am I going to do? So what did he do? He tried. And he didn't try to just change it slightly. How many Supreme Court justices did he try to add? Four. Okay. So you take, and, and every time there's a Supreme Court 
justice nominated and named. And we've talked about this multiple times now. It changes the balance of power in the Supreme Court, which makes it, if FDR was going to appoint um, these up to four, because he would appoint a Supreme Court justice for everyone over the age of 70, a sitting justice over the age of 70, they were going to be friendlier to his, uh, his acts, right? And they wouldn't shut him down. So, um, even though he was extremely popular, the public said, no, no, that, that's going a little bit too far. All right? Um, it wasn't popular with Democrats or Republicans, and we had had nine since 1869. So he was not able to, to do that. However, the Supreme Court, whether they felt threatened by this or not, uh, they didn't shoot down many more of his acts. Okay? So, and uh, during, his, <laughs> during his terms, because he served, uh, he was serving four terms when he died, his fourth term when he died, um, many of those justices actually retired. And so he ended up appointing many of the justices during his tenure, okay? So <clears throat> this New Deal, which was a, a fundamental shift in these constitutional views, okay, in some ways, was uh, very disconcerting to some of the judges. All right, does that make sense? Okay. But he tried. Um, the Roosevelt recession was an economic slippage there in 1937 where when he, um, as he was taking Social Security out of people's paychecks, they had less money to buy. And if you have less money to buy, then that um, dampens the economic situation, right? Less disposable income means you're not going to buy as much Right? So this is what they call the Roosevelt Recession, and it's tied to the Social Security Act, because that's when they started taking more money out. Right? But this is also when um, he decided that with this deficit spending, you know, there's going to be political backlash if I don't spend more, if I don't help more with this. Um, and so by 1938, he decided that he would use this new relief spending, okay, to help. In 1939, 17% of the nation was jobless. Okay? 17. All right. Um, some of the final measures in growing opposition. So, the Farm Security Administration, Fair Labor Standards, Okay, national mi minimum wage was 40 cents. Okay, and the na the maximum work week was 40 hours. Okay, things that people had been trying to put into place for many, many, many years, right? Remember? How, they're, how they've um, banned child labor and then it was repealed and then now is again enacted? I, can I get a nod or two? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, the, um, did you have something, Nicholas? Oh, no, I just got the schedule meeting ends in five minutes morning. Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, so, as we're, as we're developing and as we're, um, coming out of this, the New Deal, growing opposition means that he's not having as, as easy of a time passing things. It's not as popular, okay? So by 1939, really the New Deals are being, it's the end of those types of acts that he's done, okay? And then 
I just wanted to show you some of the Dorothea Lang photos. Here's one of the more famous Dorothea Lang photo. It's the migrant mother. Um, she had the name of this photo is destitute pea worker pea pickers in California, mother of seven children, age 32, in Napomo, California. And here she's got three kids with her, um, three out of the seven. And I mean, the, they had come over, and migrant workers are working in the fields wherever they can find. Wherever they can find work. This was February or March of 1936. Okay. So the psychological and social impact was huge. Uh, you cannot negate the psychological impact. You worked hard. Up to this point, you worked hard. You worked hard. You were successful. If you weren't working, you were a failure. Okay. This is why the suicide rate was so high this time. I mean... People couldn't ha people couldn't handle it. All right, unions are growing, as um, and you've seen this. When the economy is bad, when things are are poor, the unions have a rise because it's helping workers. Right. Well, at this point, not only is it are they shooting for higher wages, but it's a friendlier. Uh, situation with the government who is now enacting laws saying you can use collective bargaining and you can use a closed shop right previous to this they didn't have that backing but with these different laws all right so that's really one of the uh one of that one of the reasons um racism and exploitation did it stop during this time not at all Okay, uh, FDR was friendlier on the governmental level to blacks, Hispanics, and natives okay, than other presidents. All right, his wife also was very, uh, she, she sat in the middle of the Democratic Convention, okay, in the South. Blacks were on one side, whites were on the other. She wasn't going to sit one side or the other, she sat directly in the middle, okay, to make a point. And she made a dramatic point, okay. Um, the poverty level for natives, blacks, Hispanics, was higher than for the rest. Many of them had lost their jobs to the whites uh, during this time, okay. But again, you know, things were changing, things were slowly improving. Uh, Natives got the voting rights in 1924. Um, and the American Indian Defense Association, the Indian Reorganization Act, okay, all these things were building uh, tribes back up. Okay? Uh, photo here of a no attack child. And then you see again in response um, avenues of escape where people are trying to change their <laughs> change their attitudes you know you can only hold, you can only handle so much bad news um, at a time all right we're probably going to get cut off so we'll stop here and continue on we're going to do chapter 25 next week did you all um, what did you think of the Alaska far away Nicholas Now we get cut off. Bummer.